Well, good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to this event. Um, I am Bill Jeffrey, the chair of the Police Foundation Trustees. Um, I'm sure many of you will know, most of you will know, in fact, that the foundation is the UK's leading think tank and research foundation on policing. Uh, we're a charity, uh, we're independent, and we prize our independence. Um, we have all the players in policing, government, um, the political parties, the police service itself, academia. Um, for many years, we've wanted to do a major strategic review of policing. Um, extraordinarily, it's now 60 years, almost to the day, since the last such fundamental review uh, by the Royal Commission on Policing. Um, that Royal Commission set the landscape for policing, an enormous amount of which has endured um, to this day. I mean, when I, as a very young civil servant, joined the Home Office in 1971, it was still fresh in the memories of many of my colleagues, at least one of whom had actually served on the Royal Commission's Secretariat. But a great deal has changed since then, um, and much of the change has, particularly in recent years, has been so profound that it's outpaced the ability of our policing structures and arrangements um, to deal with it. Um, Governments tend not to go in for Royal Commissions these days. They t I think they probably take too long, and, and public life at the moment moves much quicker than that. Um, but we felt that if we allowed ourselves a couple of years, we could do a decent job um, without the resources of a Royal Commission, um, but with the ambition um, to produce something that would last and was um, worth having and uh, covered the ground and was, above all, informed by the actual evidence and by research. Uh, so the publication of this report today is a great landmark for the Police Foundation. And I want to really to uh, thank many of those who've been involved in producing it. Um, I want to thank really, first of all, Michael Barber, who took on the chairmanship amongst his many other commitments. Uh, Michael has um, a, a, a well-deserved reputation for independence thoughtfulness and a focus on actually delivering results, uh, as I discovered many years ago when I worked with him when he was in the Prime Minister's delivery unit. And he's led this work with great skill uh, and charm and, 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 and ability. We've also had a strong advisory board, several of whose members are here today, I'm glad to say, who haven't always agreed, but who've always brought great insight and, and, and ideas and suggestions. Um, and have contributed greatly to the work. Um, above all, in some ways, because the work needs to be done in detail, um, we've had an absolutely splendid Police Foundation team which has done the analysis, the drafting, marshalling the research, uh, and, and, and writing the report. I also ought to thank, and do warmly, uh, the, the sponsors without whose support um, this work would not have been possible. Um, we are a charity, we rely on uh, getting income to support activity of this kind and we've been uh, loyally supported by the Doors Trust, by our host this morning, Deloitte, um, by CGI, by the City of London Corporation and by Mark 43. That's really all I had to say. Um, I, the pattern of the event is that Michael Barber will set the scene and then our director, Rick Muir, and we'll set out the findings in a bit more detail. And then after that, there will be plenty of time for questions, for comments, and the Q&A comment session uh, will be chaired by Dame Sarah Thornton, um, currently the independent uh, modern slavery commissioner, but better known to most of us uh, as the former, uh, very senior and respected police officer of her generation, who was chair of the National Police Chiefs Council. So without further ado, over to Michael Barber. Thank you very much, Bill. Well, look, th th thank you all very much indeed for coming. Um, uh, I want to add to my thanks, uh, thanks to Rick and Bill for inviting me to do this. It's been an absolute privilege to work with them and the outstanding team at the Police F F Foundation over the last two or three years and I've learned such a lot. It's been absolutely fantastic. And uh, the advisory board that um, Bill also mentioned has 
you made such a fantastic contribution. You, before meetings, they were sending in long emails, very uh, thoughtful, provoking, fantastic. So it's been the best advisory group I've ever had anything to do with. And Sarah, who is going to chair the Q and A session, was a was a key figure in in that throughout. So it's been a privilege and an honour for me to be part of this. The second thing I want to say by way of introduction before I get into our, our report is, as a result of this work, um, I've met lots of frontline police officers in um, four different police forces that I've visited. Uh, I would have visited more if there hadn't been a, a lockdown. Um, but I do want, to be, because obviously the report is calling for change and there's some critical commentary to be uh, made, uh, as, as you'll see, but I want to salute the courage and the commitment of the thousands of police officers who every day are acting outstandingly uh, to make the lives of the rest of us better and more uh, opportunity, more fulfillment for the rest of us. Uh, so I salute the vast majority of the fantastic police officers we have across the country um, for their work. And this report, if it were all implemented, would help them do their job every day better and more effectively uh, and therefore help the rest of us uh, lead better lives. As Bill says, it's quite a major report. Uh, we spent three years on it, uh, pretty much. Uh, there's, uh, you'll be able to read the, the full report if you want to. It's, over two, it's, it's about 200 pages long. There's 50 substantial recommendations. You've all got a summary. Um, I want to emphasize what Bill said. It's an independent uh, report. So it's not done for the government. It's not party political. Uh, although I must say the government expressed great interest in the work as it's unfolded and, uh, and now in the recommendations. So it's independent, it's strategic. We intentionally tried to look 10 to 20 years ahead, look at the state of affairs now and see where things might go. Um, it's a proper review as well. We've looked at a lot of the evidence from within the country. Uh, Rick uh, and many of the advisory group are very well connected into to the research in this area. Uh, and then we've looked at the uh, all kinds of data. We've looked at other countries. We've looked at the history. So it's evidence-based, it's focused, uh, it's thoughtful, and it draws on a, a wide range of very uh, uh, outstanding thinking about the future of policing. We took our title for the, for the report uh, from uh, uh, Sir Robert Peel, inevitably, uh, I guess. Uh, he talks about a new mode of protection why did he do that? Well, before the Metropolitan Police Act of 1829, he made the case in Parliament the year earlier to set up the committee that led to that act. And this is the argument that he made. The time has come when we may freely pronounce that the country has outgrown her police institutions. In other words, the world has changed, he was saying, as a result of industrialization and all the other things that were happening in the early 19th century. The world has changed. Policing needs to change too. And we think that that argument is applies again now. Uh, the country has outgrown its policing institutions and it needs uh, to, to move on. We've got to, to put in a cliche an analogue policing uh, set of arrangements in a, in a digital world. Of course a lot has changed, uh, much of it for the better since Peel's time. As you can see in these pictures of the uh, original Peelites, uh, Peelers and the and the current uh, uh, police force uh, here. And one thing that has changed a lot since Peel's time is the number of uh, women police officers and the number of distinguished leaders of our police forces who are women. Uh, and that's got to keep changing, but it's worth mentioning on International Women's Day. Um, but one element that has stayed consistent from Peel's time is the idea of policing by consent. Uh, if you go back to the debates in the 1820s, they were very clearly making a distinction between the police force they were developing in Britain compared to, say, France, which was still, uh, although Napoleon had gone, uh, still uh, policed by a Napoleonic tradition. They didn't want that. They wanted policing by consent. Uh, and we found that, uh, I think, as, as the British very beneficial over the two centuries since then, uh, and you, you, when you talk to people in other countries, there's a lot of admiration for the way Britain has policed itself over those, uh, century, over those decades, nearly two centuries. So the question is, how do you maintain policing by consent in the current era? And we argue in the report that as a result of the loss of confidence, public confidence in the police, that policing by consent 
is to some extent threatened at the moment, partly by some of the recent scandals, which I'm not going to go into now, uh, but that you're all familiar with and have filled the media, but also by the impact of austerity that required and um, police officers themselves felt this some retreat from community policing and so on, uh, an inability to follow up on uh, certain types of crime uh, and a sense among the public and sometimes to some extent among police officers themselves that they weren't able to do the basics that they want to do uh, for, for, for the reasons that I've just given. So we're arguing the first thing to do is to keep, maintain the focus, the idea that policing by consent is important and in order to do that, to rebuild confidence in the police. But what should we do to do that? Well, the, the, the first thing we're arguing is to get into prevention more effectively. People have talked about this a lot. There's been some activity on it. We're arguing for something really significant and strategic <coughs> in changing. We're suggesting there needs to be a new crime prevention agency with powers to, 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 to put pressure uh, on various agencies and businesses to prevent rather than simply leave the, the crime to happen and then deal with it afterwards. Nick Ross has been a member of our advisory group, has, has consistently made this case all the way through. We want to, we, we emphasise in the report that, that should start with fraud. It's, it, the, the fraud uh, statistics are, are staggering. When I was working for Tony Blair and, and indeed with, with Bill Jeffrey uh, 20 years ago, and we looked at crime and uh, we had uh, a, a big emphasis on reducing sort of basic crime like vehicle crime, um, burglary, uh, robbery. Fraud didn't really feature much then, but online fraud has grown rapidly over the last 20, uh, 15, 20 years, and you're, you're, you're obviously all familiar with this. But what's really, so it's now more than 40% of all crime. When you go through the figures, for every thousand frauds, one ends in a charge. Um, we're not going to solve that problem by having more bobbies on the beat, important though that is, and I'm very glad that the uplift is, is on track. We're only going to be able to solve that problem by getting, going back to the source. And the Crime Prevention Agency would have powers, I if our report were followed, to require businesses, particularly in the, in the financial and technology uh, areas, to design crime out in the way they design their products in the first instance. And we need to look at what that would mean. But this, this is a, would be a very significant, powerful institution going upstream and trying to design crime out as far as possible. So that's a big, important recommendation, uh, and I think it's the only way we can really effectively get stuck into reducing the, the rather daunting uh, state of fraud uh, and the lack of cases that are being taken through to charge. The second thing we're saying is we need to be proactive. So we're arguing that the centre ne uh, uh, needs to be stronger and able to anticipate 5, 10, 15 years out what happens. So uh, a small strategic function in the Home Office, advising the Home Secretary, the Policing Minister uh, uh, and other, other, other government ministers on the likely trends in crime and what that might mean for policy strategy and so on. It doesn't need to be strong. It, needs to be, it doesn't need to be big. It needs to be high quality uh, and really uh, well connected into many of the, the, the networks that are represented in this room. The third thing we're saying is policing needs to be visible. The police officers I spoke to on the front line, and you're all familiar with this, knew that under the pressure of austerity when 20,000 fewer police officers were there by the end of that than at the beginning, inevitably there was some retreat from uh, being able to do community policing as effectively as people wanted to. And we think that needs to be uh, turned around. There needs to be more visible policing. We, we, we looked at the whole question of how many police forces there should be, which is the question everybody uh, at the beginning said, well, when, wh what's the answer to, is it going to be 43 or is it going to be 15? We said, well, we're going to come to that at the end. And what we've actually done is look at the patterns of crime and talk about a structure built around the patterns of crime rather than a particular number of police officers. And we're saying strengthen the centre. Uh, we'll, we'll come to the National Crime Agency in a minute. Strengthen the strategic function in the Home Office. And then we're saying have 43 police forces, keep them uh, the, the number as, as they are, but focused on local crime with uh, the ability to do community policing. They can be the front line in turning around confidence in, 
in, in the police uh, more generally. And the uplift is obviously going to help contribute to that. Uh, and we think police and crime commissioners have been a good development. We've been on the third cycle of those. Uh, we've seen the potential benefits of that, and we're just talking about empowering them further to tackle crime at local level. So, so prevention, proactive, visible, uh, and uh, then um, oh, so it's just a picture of two people doing community policing, um, and then enhanced capability. There are areas where it's quite clear that. Um, our policing arrangements aren't strong enough to tackle the criminal gangs that they're dealing with. So we're talking about the National Crime Agency we've been impressed with. We think it needs to be strengthened. We think it needs to take responsibility for the Rokus and have a, a proper regional presence and be dealing with uh, 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 the, the, what the big crime syn syndicates are doing, drugs and uh, weapons and people trafficking. Uh, and money laundering and such things and greatly just shift the odds against the criminal gangs and in favour of law and order. Uh, and that will be a big change for the better, we argue, in tackling with those, those things. So while we've got, so if you, if you go through that prevention, proactive thinking, visible policing, enhanced capability, and then finally, uh, we're talking about high standards. Um, some of the recent scandals have put this issue very firmly on the agenda, uh, but there's a whole set of questions about police leadership development, about police learning, which really need to be moved on. If you, uh, I'm sure you do, but I've talked, I talk with police officers at the front line, they are pretty scathing about their learning opportunities, their learning and development. They want enhanced career prospects. They want much better leadership development from sergeant right up to chief constable and so on. So we're talking about redrawing all of that in a quite radical way, giving the College of Policing uh, powers and, fu and funding to bring that about. And we're also talking about a five-year renewable license to practice for every police officer. That will help deal with the relatively small number of people who are not fit to be part of the police service or incompetent, but it will also enhance the opportunities for every police officer because it will put their learning and development on the agenda in a very clear and visible way. Uh, and that's why we think it's important. It's going to improve the whole police uh, service, its skills, its development and its culture, as well as tackle the people who we clearly, uh, the small number that we don't want and that their colleagues don't want in the police service. So it will help reshape the culture. So that's, um, that's the headlines of what we're saying in the report. Um, we look forward to the questions that you're going to ask uh, later on. But right now, I'm going to hand over to Rick Muir, who's going to take you through uh, some of the data and evidence behind the headlines that I've just given. Thanks, Michael, um, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I should also say welcome to the people on the live stream. We have about 300 people watching uh, on the internet. Um, who are probably a bit warmer in their own homes than we are in this uh, rather cold room. Um, but I was hoping as people gathered it might uh, warm things up a bit. Um, uh, as as um, Michael says, we've been doing a lot of work on this over the last uh, three years. Um, the review fell into uh, two parts. One was to look at the challenge facing the police service and the other was to look at how do we respond uh, to that challenge. So first of all, I'm going to... Um, talk about the challenge. Um, the first thing to note about that is that um, traditional crime, um, as measured in the crime survey, has fallen by a lot, fallen by 75% since the mid-1990s. And that's really important. That's less burglary, less car crime, less violence. Um, and in many ways, we are, a, in that sense, a much safer society uh, than we were. Um, but what's replaced those forms of traditional crime are uh, a number of things. And we argue that there are three big transformations which are changing the context for public safety. The first is the technological revolution, which Michael talked about. 53% um, of crime last year in England and Wales was just fraud and cybercrime, which, when you think about it, is pretty astonishing. You know, over half of all crime affecting people in England and Wales was just fraud and cybercrime, crimes which didn't really exist um, in quite the same way uh, 20 years ago, and in terms of cybercrime, didn't exist at all. 
Um, so that is a fundamental transformation of the nature of crime, and we have a police service which was not designed to deal with that kind of thing. There's also a set of um, transformations related to humanity's relationship with the natural environment, and we think um, the way in which we, re we relate to the natural environment is creating enormous turbulence at the moment, and turbulence which has consequences for public safety. Most obviously, of course, in terms of climate change, more extreme weather events, more forced migration, potentially hundreds of millions of people being forced to move from warmer parts of the world to cooler parts of the world with hugely significant political and social implications. Um, political protest as the climate heats up, the politics around climate will heat up and that obviously has implications for those charged with keeping the peace. Um, pandemics are also linked to humanity's relationship with the natural environment. Um, it is thought that they're, they're likely to become more frequent because, because of deforestation, because of agricultural intensification, which means it's more likely that novel diseases such as coronaviruses can pass from animals um, to humans. And so um, some very significant environmental changes which have implications for public safety. Thirdly, there's a whole set of social changes um, which are taking place at the same time, and we highlight three in the, in the report. The first is the increased complexity of social needs, which means there's a whole set of social needs that can't be dealt with or tackled within the confines of a single public service. Um, and we can see this, for example, in the rise of missing person incidents, which the police have to deal with, as Michael said. We can see it in the rise of mental health incidents. You know, policing has essentially become the emergency response service for mental health crisis, um, which is a, you know, a strange place for us to have got to, but th there it is. Um, so an increased complexity of need that, that requires a very different kind of approach. The second set of social changes we highlight in the report are um, previously victims of previously neglected forms of violence and abuse demanding justice in a way that they haven't in the past. Um, and you can see that in the rise of um, sexual offences, the huge rise in sexual offences reported to the police, the huge rise in child sexual offences being reported to the police, the increase in domestic abuse incidents being reported to the police. These are things that have always happened, but the victims of these crimes are now demanding justice and society wants to provide them with justice in a way that wasn't the case in the past. And that has very significant implications for the nature of police work. And the final set of social changes we highlight in the report are new forms of tension um, and social division that require careful management by those with responsibilities for keeping the peace and maintaining public order. Um, we've seen a big increase in the number of hate crimes um, reported to the police. And of course, there's all the issues around uh, violent extremism and um, terrorism, which uh, we will all be familiar with. So amidst all of that social change, um, how well are the police doing? Well, um, the metrics we highlight in the report show that um, you know, many of the key metrics of police um, performance in terms of outcomes have been deteriorating in recent years. Response times have been getting longer. Victim satisfaction has declined. You'll see here that detection rates have more than halved in the last, um, or have uh, almost halved in the last um, seven years. Lots of complex reasons for that, but nonetheless, you know, fewer uh, reported offences um, being brought to justice. And as Michael says, we have a fall in public confidence. Public confidence rose in the latter part of the 2000s, and it then plateaued um, uh, through the, um, most of the 2010s, and it started to fall in recent years. And the latest data, which we have in London, shows an even sharper fall there, and a particularly worrying fall in trust in the police. So there are red warning lights flashing around this issue of public trust and confidence which we think need to be addressed. Now, as Michael said, it's really important to stress the, the vast majority of police officers are really dedicated, going out, working hard, and doing their best to serve the public. And this isn't a reflection on their hard work and dedication. It's also important to say that um, HMIC FRS has found that police forces are becoming more efficient in the way they're using their resources. And so our analysis is that this isn't that you know, the, the, the police service is incompetent in some way. It is more that society is changing radically and the service has not yet been able to keep up with the pace of that change. So we draw three implications from that description of the challenge. First, there's a capacity challenge. The police on their own cannot deal with the volume range and complexity of the demands which the 21st century are throwing at it. 
Secondly, there is a capability challenge. The police lack many of the capabilities at a systemic level required to tackle current and future challenges. And third, there's an organisational challenge. The police service does not possess the right organisational platform upon which to deliver the capabilities required. So first of all, in terms of the capacity challenge, this challenge is, as I said, that policing on its own can't respond to all of the stuff that I've just... It cannot deal with all of the stuff that I just described. And we have two responses to that in the report. The first response is that we need to think about policing as part of a wider public safety system. And the second response is that we need to be clearer about the role of the police within that system. So the public safety system. Um, we have a criminal justice system, but we don't have a public safety system. We have a criminal justice system with institutions, with accountability, with budgets, with allocated roles and responsibilities, we do, which, which deals with holding people accountable for crimes after they've been committed. We do not have a public safety system which attempts to prevent crime and happening uh, crime and harm happening in the first place. Everybody says prevention is a good idea, um, but it's nobody's job to do it, or it's everybody's job to do it, and nobody really focus on it, focuses on it sufficiently. And so we think we need to look at other safety systems. For example, we have a health and safety system, which is about preventing accidents in the workplace. We have an air safety system, which is about preventing planes from falling to the sky. And in both of those systems, there's very little emphasis, actually, on investigating what happened afterwards and, and holding people to account. We do need to do that. Um, but in those systems, there's a real focus on preventing those things from happening in the first place. And we argue the same approach needs to be taken with crime and harm. And the first steps towards doing this are, we argue, to create an institution responsible for doing it. Um, so that is the Crime Prevention Agency, which Michael talked about, um, which would have the power to enforce a general duty on business to prevent crime. We're not saying that takes you all of the way to a public safety system, but these are the first steps towards building a fundamental shift in our approach to crime away from just dealing with it after it's happened to trying to prevent it happening in the first place. And a core focus of this would be on driving down the surging levels of fraud and cybercrime, which we currently do not have much of an answer to. Um, there, there is a complete, at the national level, a lack of strategic um, grip on this question of fraud and cybercrime. Uh, it can't be dealt with just by the police pursuing it after it's happened. It has to be designed out at source, and that's what we want the Crime Prevention Agency to do. Secondly, in relation to capacity, we need to, we need to think about the role of the police within that wider system. And we set out in the report a definition of what we think the core role of the police is. We reject the idea that the police are just crime fighters. That's obviously not true. If you look at the history of policing and you look at demand on the police, most of it is not crime. Um, but what we do say is that we need a, a, a definition of the police role which at least has some boundaries around it. So we have some sense of what it is that the police should be doing and what it is that others should be doing. And so we, we talk about... Um, the core role of the police is being to promote public safety by maintaining order and upholding the law, which their unique powers enable them to do, and to carry out other activities which enable them to perform this core role legitimately, effectively, and with minimum reliance on those powers. And in the report, we talk about a whole set of functions which flow from that. The next challenge, which I'm going to talk about, is the capability challenge. Now, no, I'm talking here about systemic capabilities rather than operational capabilities. We're looking at these, these are characteristics of the system rather than uh, operational day-to-day uh, -day capabilities. The first capability, which is absolutely fundamental, as Michael said, is legitimacy. We think this comes before all else because if the police are not trusted by the public, then they are unable to perform their task and unable to police by consent. And so we think legitimacy is crucial. We've said that we think public confidence is falling and act action needs to be taken to address that. And so we talk about a long-term plan to rebuild um, uh, public confidence and legitimacy. We talk about reinvesting in neighbourhood policing. We talk about reforms to the use of stop and search, which we think is damaging confidence in the police among um, uh, uh, among black people in particular, um, and we talk about improving the diversity of the police workforce, um, as, as Michael described. Secondly, um, we talk about skills, and in the report we identify three areas of, um, uh, of gaps um, in, in, the, in the terms of the skills of the current workforce. Relational skills, um, there's not enough emphasis on interpersonal skills in police training, and these are absolutely vital 
in order to make sure that people can de-escalate situations, communicate um, effectively with the public and police with legitimacy. There, is, there are significant investigatory gaps. We're almost 7,000 detectives short now nationally of where we need to be. This is a real serious problem if we want to um, investigate crime more effectively. And we talk about doing a lot more direct entry detective schemes. We talk about increasing the pay of detectives because they're, they're currently, people are currently dis financially disincentivized from wanting to choose to become a detective. Um, and we also talk about digital skills in the police workforce as well. Um, we think that the College of Policing should do much more to set out more consistent career pathways for people who work in allied police professions such as digital forensics, such as data analysis, so people can look at a career in policing with those skills and think, yeah, I'm going I'm to get involved in policing and make uh, a contribution. Learning, as Michael said, is absolutely key to raising standards and to giving people the opportunities to develop in their roles. Um, we heard, as Michael said, um, you know, a, a lot of criticism for officers about the quality of the training that they receive, um, and we think, uh, and we think that needs to be improved. We think there needs to be a significant investment in it, and we do also argue for a license to practice, which we think would change the whole culture around learning and development, um, and would significantly help to raise standards. Technology, um, we highlight in the report that the police national computer is almost 50 years old, and is about to be run on the basis of. Um, technology which cannot be serviced. Um, you know, there's a serious problem in, t in terms of police technology. There is good work going on in terms of the national digital strategy and the police digital service um, that they're trying to um, address these issues, but we think it needs to go much further. And in particular, we call for more investment because we do think it needs more investment, but we also think um, that there needs to be an agency at the centre that has the, has the power to set common standards in relation to IT so that the police service can genuinely start to share data and intelligence. Leadership is another core capability um, which we address in the report. And as Michael said, at the core, we support the idea that the College of Policing should develop a new national leadership centre. Um, and this is not just about senior leadership. We want, we think, key to addressing all of the issues that are being discussed at the moment about toxic culture, about people not meeting the standards, people not meeting expectations. The key to doing that is to make sure that sergeants and inspectors have the support and the training that they need to be the leaders that they want to be. We think strengthening frontline supervision is absolutely critical to addressing cultural issues, to addressing, to improving professional development and to improving well-being. Finally, well-being, um, we call this a capability because if you, if you don't have a, uh, a healthy workforce, then you're not able to do um, the things that you need to do. And there's lots of signs of um, significant amounts of post-traumatic stress within uh, the police workforce and many other um, uh, mental health issues which we think need to be addressed. And we think much stronger uh, clinical supervision uh, is required. And we make a number of recommendations around that. Now, finally, I come to the organisational challenge. And the thing to say here is we, um, the local dimension is absolutely critical, as Michael said. Um, and so we, we argue that we shouldn't sort of uh, you know, abolish the 43 forces. We argue to maintain them um, because we think it's really important to have a local dimension for two reasons. One is it's really important for public confidence reasons that the police are able to respond if flexibly to local, to the, to the, uh, to local communities. And secondly, to deal with the complex issues that we described, the complex social needs, you need to have significant amounts of local autonomy so that the police can work collaboratively with health, with local authorities and others. And for those reasons, we think it's really important there's a strong local dimension. However, the current organisational platform has um, significant flaws. The first is it's not designed to tackle cross-border crime, um, which is where crime is moving. And so that is a, that is a very significant problem. Um, the second is it's not good at developing specialisms, which all of the evidence on specialism is that it's best that specialisms are brigaded at a more concentrated level so people can learn and improve uh, together. Thirdly, we think it's inefficient. There's massive amounts of duplication out there. We don't think all 43 forces need their own HR de department, their own finance department, all of their own operational support units and so on. And so uh, there's a lot of money could be saved, we think, by rationalising. And we don't want to save money just for the sake of saving money. We want that reinvested in frontline policing. The regional tier 
is precarious at the moment. It doesn't have a statutory basis and it doesn't have stable funding. And the centre, strategic centre, is too weak. Um, we need to have um, power, we need to have agencies and organisations at the centre that can drive change in the system, and that's not possible with the current organisational platform that we have. So, um, what does this mean for the different tiers? First of all, the 43 local forces should focus on local policing. 24-7 response, local crime investigation, neighbourhood policing, safeguarding and offender management. At the regional level, um, we think specialist capabilities, operational support and business support functions should be merged into regional police support units so that those functions can be provided at a much more efficient and effective level than they currently are. Um, we think this would unlock considerable savings um, which could then be reinvested in frontline policing. We think that there should be a significant strengthening of the National Crime Agency. Um, as Michael said, the structure needs to follow where the, where the crime has gone. And what we need to do, therefore, is, have, is, is to house those capabilities within an organisation whose singular priority is serious and organised crime. And so that's why we argue for the regional organised crime units to become part of the National Crime Agency. And at the centre, we need a stronger strategic centre. As, as Michael said, a stronger role for the Home Office in terms of setting a strategic direction for policing, a clear strategic direction, with the Home Secretary um, uh, using her powers proactively to drive change where necessary. Um, and we think that the governance should be provided as it currently is through a tripartite arrangement of the NPCC, the APCC and the Home Office. But we think that the delivery organisation should be rationalised. There's far too many organisations at the national level doing overlapping things and very few of them have any powers to really drive change. Um, so we think we need three delivery organisations at the centre, an agency to prevent crime, which we talked about, an agency to pursue um, and disrupt serious and organised crime, the Strengthen National Crime Agency, and an agency to improve policing. And um, that, we argue, ought to be a reformed and expanded college of policing, which would take on, which would consolidate all of the existing police improvement functions and would be given th powers in three areas. One, to set some binding minimum standards in areas where the public expects cons consistency, in areas that are high risk, and in areas where the evidence base is really clear about what the police should do. There should be some... Authorised professional practice should remain, but there should be some mandatory standards which all for forces would have to follow. Um, secondly, um, the uh, College of Policing would have a workforce planning function so that we shouldn't get into a situation where we're 7,000 detectives short because it would have been spotted earlier and steps would have been implemented to make sure that doesn't um, occur. And thirdly, we think the uh, College of Policing should have powers in relation to, to IT to make sure that we at last address this question of how we share data and intelligence throughout the system and we have one um, system of um, uh, communications and information technology, not um, 43 uh, different systems. And so um, the College of Policing needs to have powers in that area as well. So these are the main recommendations that we make. The Crime Prevention Agency, a strengthened National Crime Agency, a license to practice for all police officers to improve professional development and raise standards, the merger of back office and specialist functions, and an investment in frontline policing, training and technology. But I come back at the end to where Michael started, which is with Robert Peel. Um, one of the main claims we are making in this report is that the time, the changes we're living through now are as radical, as significant as the changes that were swirling around in the England of the Industrial Revolution when Robert Peel stood before Parliament and said that we may fairly pronounce that the country has outgrown her police institutions and the cheapest and safest course will be found in the introduction of a new mode of protection. Um, so we need to be as ambitious in rethinking and redesigning our public safety systems now as Peel was then. Um, so it will require bold um, and radical decisions uh, to make that happen. But the prize, if we can reach it, is a great one, which is to renew for our time the promise of Peel's model of policing, which is a form of policing that serves the people rather than oppresses the people, and which we believe can still be an example to the world in the great art of reconciling order with liberty. Thank you very much.
And I'm now, now going to hand over to, uh, to Dame Sarah Thornton to chair the question and answer in session and discussion. I'm really glad, actually, that spontaneous applause broke out there, because I did feel we should have uh, applauded Michael as well, because this, this report uh, is an absolute tour de force. You've just got the summary with the 56 recommendations. It is worth having a good look at the 200 pages in terms of the analysis of the challenges. For those of us who love uh, a data set, there's lots of really good data, lots of material for speeches and uh, articles for the next few years. So, so well done uh, and uh, thank you for all the hard work, not just to Michael and Rick, but to, to the team that work behind the scenes. So the plan now is to have um, questions or comments or points of view. There's lots of people who know lots of things about policing in this room, um, but there's also a lot of people online who know a lot about policing. So um, I'm going to chair it until the energy dissipates. Um, but I thought, while well, you're all think, well, you see, Rob Beckley's hand is already peeking up. Uh, I was going to go to somebody online to be fully inclusive to begin with, then I'll come to you next, Rob, in the, in the room. But if you could just say who you are uh, and, and, and maybe who you work for or what you used to do or something like that, that would be really helpful. But I'm going to take a, a question online first because um, I suspect a lot of uh, operational and frontline people will be saying this. This is from Daniel Jewell, who is in Sussex Police. And Daniel says, you talk a lot about the uplift in numbers. However, arguably the numbers you speak of have not made a dent on numbers in terms of what has been lost over the years owing to austerity and retirement. How can there be an increased presence within our communities without the numbers you suggest? We had big debates, didn't we, Michael and Rick, about numbers? Mm. What do you think? Well, um, I'll, I'll um, hand over to Rick in. I, I, the 20,000 extra police officers, the uplift, are definitely a, an important contribution, and that is going to restore police numbers to roughly where they were in uh, 2010. Uh, and I think that is good. Um, personally, I think um, community support officers were also a very uh, important contribution to, um, to visibility. And um, above and beyond that, I think rebuilding... Um, community policing in the way that was established in the late 2000s uh, would be a really good start at local level. So I'm not sure uh, what Daniel is arguing for above and beyond that, but this thing need, that this needs to be kept under review and releasing money that's wasted on bureaucracy and pushing it into frontline policing will also help. It's worth remembering that police and crime commissioners can, if they want, um, raise uh, the precept by uh, running a referendum. The, the, the guy in Warwickshire did a, a good job of that and invested that money in crime and uh, I in frontline officers. So there's lots of room for, for improvement. But there, there is a spending review uh, about to start, the three-year spending review, that will need to be built on in, in the future. But I think that what is happening now will definitely help to address the issues, if not solve them all. That's Rick. Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe what Daniel is referring to is, of course, the officers may come back, but the police staff won't recover to the same levels, and some of the so some of the back office support uh, won't be there. But we think that, um, uh, and you know, we recognise that. Um, uh, overall, what we're calling for in this report is an increase in investment in policing. We do call for an increase in investment in policing over the next decade. So we're not. Uh, we're not limited to the envelope set by the government in its current spending review. We think over time investment needs to be increased. But once you've got the 20,000 officers in place, we then need to focus on dealing with these skills gaps, digital forensics, data analytics, these areas which, which are required to, make us, to, to ensure that we're um, addressing the challenges of the future. Um, and to make sure that the police of the, the 20,000 we've got are deployed in the most effective ways possible. And you can't do that if you don't have the, the analysts that you need um, to make sure that policing is um, capable of thinking intelligently about how to use its resources. So, um, so I think we need investment in all of those areas in addition to the, the, the new officers which have been recruited at the moment. So the report is basically an argument for investment, but a broad investment in this whole system. Uh, Rob Beckley.
for such a duty and uh, the way it should be managed. So, um, so you, you, you partly answered the question that I was going to say, which is the elephant in the room has to be resourced. Um, and and, and you, you talk about it's an argument for investment, but you won't land, and you won't land the changes in the College of Heating and elsewhere in the, in the ecosystem unless there is actually a really substantial uplift in the resource in, in the whole environment here. Um, and the other area that you haven't really touched upon, and I recognize this is a strategic review of heating and not the criminal justice system, <laughs> but it's that actually the, the, the weaknesses of the, um, of, of the partnership that should be um, uh, delivered really both on the police and the other um, players in the criminal justice system. So, uh, you know, it is a major elephant in the room. How are we really going to afford it and how will we deliver it? First of all, um, thank you very much for the welcome for the, for the new really strong emphasis on prevention, which I do think is fundamentally important. And you can imagine a time, if that's working, that, that the, the pressures on the current policing system would be reduced if you're getting the prevention working well. Um, we do argue, and Bill might want to come in on this because he, he, he gave a lot of thought to the, to the resourcing section of our, um, uh, of our report. Um, we do argue for increasing rules. There is a spending review period about to start at the beginning of April, a three-year spending review. There is increased resource for, for policing and, uh, and other, other functions in that. And, um, but we're not saying that's the end of the story, uh, but there's only so much you can do at any given moment. The, the other thing which um, is important and is implied in what you said is that the other services beyond policing, whether it's mental health or, 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 or the NHS or, or, or social care, those things need to need to recover from austerity too and the police need better partnerships with those things so that that, that we w i mean rick, rick used the, the the words a public safety system in which everybody plays their part i do think that's where so, so the resourcing is not just about resourcing of policing it's resourcing uh, of these other functions um so i, I think that there is uh you know, we are, it's not an elephant in the room in the sense that it's, we do address the resourcing. There's a whole chapter on how we might do that. And I don't know if Bill wants to come in on that. Yes, I will, Michael. <laughs> I, I, th I think Rob makes a very good point. Uh, the, the position as we had it I mean, as an independent review was that we could not create resources. What we could do is give our best estimate of, of, um, of what was acquired. Um, I, I mean, I had worked around the Treasury for long enough to know that something that simply came up with a long shopping list would be quite hard to, to land effectively. Uh, we weren't able to cost everything in great detail, uh, but we were able to say that there were some significant items that we thought were important that would definitely involve additional cost. Having said that, particularly in relation to the, uh, the, the, the mandated regional structures, which would deliver substantial savings, we felt that as a bottom line, we could say that this wasn't all one way and that a government that wanted to pursue it over a period of time um, ought to be able to find it affordable. Can I just ask you, Michael, because you, you came in from sort of outside in a way. You're not yeah. a policing person by background, uh, but a very broad experience in, in public policy. Rick outlined the issues about missing from home and mental health and the extent to which that does take up a lot of resource of front line. What, what, what conclusions did you personally draw? Were you surprised by that? Do you think we've kind of, policing has got into providing services which really they're not suited to? I, I think, well, for the, the experience of spending time with front line officers made me think that actually these are serious professional people and when they discover a missing person, they know that if they don't do it, nobody will do it, so they go and do it because they're genuine, thoughtful people who care about that or dealing with a mental health, person with a mental health condition. But what's, what was very depressing for me and for them, but m much more than for me, is that they, they go and fix some problem. They sort out, so I, I went with police officers, dealt with a violent young man, and on the way back, they're saying, we'll be back there in a week. Nothing will happen in the meantime. So this, this is about the, the relationship between the police and the other social service. So I don't bl blame the police on the, on the, on the at all for do doing those things. In fact, I credit them for doing that because they're picking up the pieces that other people have neglected. But we do need to get better at sorting all that out. And uh, I don't want to go into a long thing about this, but the Treasury is absolutely at the heart of this. 
And as you know, Sarah, I, I've done work for the mm -hmm. Treasury on what is public value and how you measure it. And that needs to be brought to the heart of this. So you, if you are running a, a mental health service, but actually you're externalising a lot of costs onto the police, you shouldn't get credit for that. And the, the Treasury are working on that whole public value framework that I did for them in 2017 that is built in part into the current spending view and will continue to be important. But we have to get people taking responsibility for the tasks they're given and for which they're given money and not externalising costs onto, onto others. And then just want I just want to make one point that reinforces something Rick said earlier. Investment in police technology is fundamentally important uh, to, to dealing with these things. I remember that work about the value in the system, yeah, and yeah. I think it really does need to be looked at again. There's a gentleman there on the second back row. I think you've got the microphone. Great. Could you say who you are, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm John McTernan. I'm a former colleague of Michael uh, and Bill's from when I was in, in government as an advisor. Um, I'm, I live in Peckham. I'm a London citizen, and I really want to. There's so much to respond to in the in the recommendations, in the presentations. So much to read in the report. Uh, I want to focus on legitimacy. Two of the biggest public manifestations of concern about policing happened during the pandemic. Uh, the vigil for Sarah Everard and the policing of that and Black Lives Matter demonstrations. I just wondered if you implemented all of the recommendations, they're all implemented, yeah, would, would these recommendations lead to success in reducing domestic violence, success in prosecuting rape and sexual assault and success in reducing um, the, the knifing and murders of young people uh, on the streets. Because in the end, policing is legitimized if it's successful. So if these things were all implemented, would they succeed in reducing those headline is issues and why? Thanks. Um, well, thanks, John. Um, very good question, an important question. I think, um, yes, we think, we think that they would because I agree with what you say that effectiveness is a core part of legitimacy. You know, so you have to be—you're uh, only going to get public confidence if people think you're effective at actually doing the the job. Um, and I think what we're saying around, um, uh, particularly in, in tackling uh, violence against women and girls, rape, sexual assault, the, the things that you mentioned, um, it's absolutely key that we have the capacity and capability within the system to do that. So we've, we've got a lot of measures in this, which is about improving investigation. Uh, of those kind of crimes, which is about recruiting a lot more detectives, um, getting more people into that. Um, you know, some of the barriers around bringing those cases forward are around technology. Uh, we talk in the report a lot about improving digital forensics, getting evidence off laptops, phones, and so on, where currently there are major, major backlogs. So yeah, in terms of those things, I think there's a lot in this report which would, um, which would lead to improvement. Can I just re reinforce that, uh, John, and thanks for, the, thanks for the question. It's a long time since I saw you, although I, I see you on Twitter almost daily. Um, but the, um, the, the d doing the basics right, the if basic effectiveness is really fundamentally important. That's what police feel when you talk to them. They want to be really effective. Uh, secondly, on some of the bigger, more challenging crimes, drugs, knife crime, uh, gang violence and so on, we need to shift the odds. People think the, the odds are stacked against the police at the moment. They want the police to be on top of it. They're not going to solve every crime, but they, seem, they need to feel that the police, that the odds are in favour of the police rather than in the, uh, the, the crime. There's a 7,000 shortage of detectives. We have to do something about that because uh, the, for, for the kinds of crimes you're talking about, you've got to not just uh, deal with them at the, the policing end, you've got to so, uh, understand the problem charge the people and then get the CPS on the case. So there's that there's a whole flow through. You'll remember it from our time in number 10 of uh, from the police through the CPS into the criminal justice system and getting that to work smoothly. So fun f f these will these things do matter. And then and then digital forensics that Rick mentioned is, is currently a huge delay and a massive frustration to detectives in the police service because they send away a load of no mobile phones and computers and wait months to get any evidence at all before they can proceed. So yes, effectiveness, doing the basics is really important and the report has lots to do with that. Can, can I, as a former police officer, just uh, add my two pennies to what you're saying? Because I think that sometimes we talk about confidence as if it's some sort of like fuzzy thing in the air. Actually, for me, it's utterly related to competence. And if you think of some of the graphs that Rick showed about what's happened to detection rates and what's happened to confidence, actually you can put some interesting yeah, correlations yeah. around them. So I don't think that confidence and competence are different. They are very much related. And on that subject, Andy Marsh, head of the college. Not you, Mark Sarah. 
Yeah, the gentleman's going to bring you on. Well, you've got a loud voice, I think. I have to have a loud voice in my, in my household. I'll sit down <laughs> so you can see. Um, so, Andy Marsh, Chief Executive of the College of Policing, but, but I, I don't want you to take my comments entirely in the context of that role because I'm a former chief of two forces mm -hmm. and I've spent a lifetime in policing. Um, and so, with all of that, I thoroughly welcome uh, these, uh, these conclusions and these recommendations. This is a much needed um, report. Um, specifically, I welcome the length you've gone to praise the dedication of our officers and staff on the front line. We need to recognise that. We'd be nowhere without them. I also um, welcome the fact that much of what you say about the development of leadership, skills, knowledge and learning echoes the points that we made in our recent fundamental review. Wi without these important attributes, policing will fail. So just going to um, make a second point and then there's a question. I, I think patently, and you recognise it, the system is not balanced. And a system that isn't balanced will fail to deliver its full potential, which also fails the public, it fails our officers and staff in helping them deliver the needs of the public. But a system that isn't balanced not only will um, under-deliver, uh, ultimately it will, it will result in some form of significant change. And perhaps not change for the better. What we need is optimization of the system. So I'll lead on to my question that um, I would say that officers and staff need more um, professional development. We need to stop being a, a craft where skills are passed from mother to daughter, father to son and so on and so on. And we, start, we need to start attributing the hallmarks of profession, which is protected learning time. It is accredited standards. Um, it is um, the leadership uh, to support people at every level. So the question is, um, I think we all recognize this. I say, I, 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 perhaps that's a bit presumptuous. Lots of people have said to you that this is needed. And that's why you've, you've come up with such a well-written report. How do we achieve the, the shift where there is more investment um, in whichever agency provides it, and I hope the college will have a big role in that. How do we um, create the shift so that uh, leaders uh, create time for this much needed development when there is such pressure on them to meet the standards of inspection, the standards of the beating crime plan and so much more? And, I, and how do we create the, the investment? And I think it is about a cultural change, but actually what I don't want to see is this report gather dust on the shelf. I'd, I'd like to see it be the start of the, the significant change for the better that, that you that you describe. I think change times are um, more turbulent than ever, and so we need to be ambitious. So what's your advice about to the leaders um, online and in the room, and not in the room, about how we achieve this? Who'd like to go first? Michael? I'm happy to go. Yeah. <coughs> first of all, thank, thank you for the welcome you gave to the report, Andy. That's, that's much appreciated. Can I say two things as, a, as an outsider to the policing fraternity in the way that Sarah mentioned me that, that, that relate directly to your question? One is, in, in having spent two and a half years of working on this report, looking at policing, it's very inward looking. And it needs to be, on this, particularly on this learning agenda, leadership development, it needs to be more outward looking. It needs to be learning from leadership development in health and education and universities and civil service and all of those things and looking at those career progressions. And um, if we want a public safety system, that police need to be part of that and then to be more outward looking than, than in my sense. I, I haven't got an evidence base for that, but that's what I sense when I debate it with people. Um, the second thing is the, the, teach, the, the, the learning and development needs to be connected to performance management uh, and progression through a career in a, in a, in a really effective, organic way. Um, and there's lots of evidence, for example, which I've looked at in other, other professions where if you learn something new, you actually unless you use it quite soon after you've learnt it, you're going to forget it again or it's going to vanish. You're not going to remember the skill. So getting learning and development built into the day-to-day -day management of police officers is a really fundamental point of this. And um, well, the, the Canadian friend of mine who writes about uh, education generally, and he, he has this phrase about the 21st century that the learning is the work and the work is the learning. So police learning and development needs to be part of their daily experience, getting feedback after an operation in a really systematic way. Um, all of those things, that and that's why when we talk about leadership development, it's not just 
people such as yourself and Sarah, important though that is, it's also about from sergeant upwards learning how to lead, how to bring learning and work together in the way that I've just described and performance management. Bill was going to come in on that um, one as well. Just, I, I think it's a very good question, Andy. And I, I, partly I'm, my answer is that our ambition for this whole exercise has always been to try to create um, some kind of consensus around the best way forward. Um, and in my experience in government, there sometimes comes a moment when everybody who can contribute to a real step forward begins to be of the same mind. Um, and I, I think my advice would be to try to contribute to that consensus. I mean, we will certainly do so in the Police Foundation. Um, I, I hardly dare say so in this building, but uh, we, we, we've got some of the skills of the consultancy profession at planting our next job in the last report, as it were. Um, but uh, I think over time, one must hope that among politicians, police leaders, others, uh, that there will be a realisation that this agenda is the one that ought to be pursued um, through events like this and others. And what I'm going to do now is bring in a question from the uh, online audience, which I'm going to put to you, Rick, because it's on this same issue of professionalisation. It's from John de Hayes of the Institute of Policing at Staffordshire University. And John says, why introduce an extra level of bureaucracy with the five-year licence? There are sufficient measures available to deal with the people who shouldn't be in the job, what we need are supervisors who are trained and capable to deal with poor performance or inappropriate behaviour. Um, well, thanks for the question, John. I think I don't think it is an extra level of bureaucracy. Actually, I think what it is is a, is a way of, as exists in for doctors, for nurses, it's a way of just um, making sure that their learning and development is absolutely at the centre and that they are demanding high quality learning and development because they want to renew their license and get that. So it creates a real push from. Uh, the professional to make sure that the system is providing what they uh, what they need, um, and and we think it could deal with some of the issues around people who, um, you know, uh, policing is a really precious thing. Police officers hold um, very intrusive powers which no one else in society holds, and we should have very high standards for police officers. And if people can't make those standards, then I'm afraid they shouldn't be police officers, and we have to be clear about that. Um, you know, we, so we think it is about setting high standards and expectations, and we think it's something that will actually, um, uh, and, and it would sit alongside looking again at the whole sort of PDR process and all of this. So we're not we're not arguing for this to be overlaid onto stuff that already exists. The whole system would need to be um, rationalised. But what we heard from police officers was. Um, that their professional development was not prioritised, that what tends to happen with their training is training tends to be oriented towards the short-term tactical needs of the organisation. You know, there's some new legislation, let's give everyone some training in that, rather than thinking about, as Michael said, the, the, you know, the development of the individual through their career and what they require. And this is part of making that kind of um, cultural shift. So we, we don't think it's um, bu bureaucratic at all, actually. I mean, I think it is about really raising standards and raising expectations and giving people the kind of learning and development um, that, that they want. So just to reinforce that, it, it, it's, it, I, it's so important. The, the, the five-year licence fact is not simply about dealing with a, a very small number of, uh, of people who shouldn't be in the police service. It's about exactly what Rick just, Rick just says, pushing their learning, professional development, career development, career progression up the agenda in a really significant way, it will be a benefit to every police officer. So I was doing strict <coughs> Buggins term, but I'm not going to right. because I'm going to go to Tom Windsor because I have a suspicion that Tom might want to say something about the issue we're just discussing. Am I right, Tom? Yes. Good. <laughs> I like the idea of Tom Windsor, Chief HMI, for a little while longer. Um, the five-year li license to practice uh, when I did the review of pay and conditions and lots of other things for the police uh, 10 years ago, um, we were very, very close to introducing something very, very like this. Uh, it, would, it, it was going to be a two-year probationary period and then 555 five, five throughout the rest of your career. And uh, we had it all designed. Uh, it was connected to not just getting rid of people who were just not performing very well, you know, the uniform carriers, the people who just turned up and did the minimum. It was also about skills, making sure that chief constables had the opportunity to change the skills mix in the police force without having, we didn't use the word dead wood, but 
you know, people who were just not getting on uh, because the skills mix is extraordinarily important for all the reasons we don't need to discuss. And we hit a brick wall. Well, we hit two brick walls. Uh, one was legal and one was the Fed. Now, I'm not suggesting that neither can be overcome, particularly since we've left the EU. But the legal uh, limitation was uh, on the, it <laughs> we have a long opinion on the, on, on the point, uh, was in relation to the uh, successive renewal of a short-term contract basically makes you a empl permanent employee. Now, you know, it's a 25-year legal, 25-page legal opinion, but that's broadly what it was. The other problem was in relation to the opposition of the Fed, because what I was concerned to do was not to do what Patrick Sheehy did, which was come up with a whole load of radical proposals and say, they're all a package. If you're not going to do all of them, then don't do any of them. And pretty much the answer was, well, we're not going to do any of them. They did some of them, but very few. I wanted my proposals to get a high degree of acceptance and for the Home Office to be able to pick up some and not others. So the Police Federation's um, anticipated opposition was ferocious and instead I recommended that there be compulsory severance. We avoided the R word redundancy but it means exactly the same thing. Um, and that was one thing that Theresa May was going to do and didn't do. Uh, because in the last year of the parliament, they, they just didn't have the political oomph to get on with it. Um, so that didn't get picked up, and of course with uplift and all the rest of it, it's just no longer an issue. But do not underestimate the opposition of the police federation to this. I'm not saying that you, it shouldn't be done. I think it should be done. But... Um, if you come up with a set of proposals, or if the Home Office adopts a set of proposals, which are going to get that degree of ferocity, 30,000 cops on the streets of London um, uh, protesting against the proposals, and this one in particular, then you're going to need a lot of political courage to push it through. But I still think you ought to do it. Thanks, Tom. And now there's a woman about four rows in front of you who's just raised her hand again with long hair. There you go. Thank you. Um, I'm Megan O'Neill from uh, Scottish Institute for Policing Research. Um, I'm very excited by the suggestions and the proposals you have here, especially around uh, refocusing on neighborhood policing and, com and community policing. Um, I just wanted to go back to the issue of police and crime commissioners that were discussed earlier. Um, because, uh, Sir Michael, you identified them as part of the solution. Um, I'm just thinking back to when police and crime commissioners were first created, and that coincided with the, um, you know, the, the linked lift of the ring fence around uh, funding for community policing. And it was at this time that we started to see the fracturing of neighborhood policing. And, and you know, Andy, of course, did a fantastic analysis of this and, and what happened subsequently. So I'm just wondering how, if you could explain a bit more about how um, you see police and crime commissioners as being part of the solution to refocusing and re revitalizing community policing when initially they were part of why it, it fractured in the first place. And can I add a question from the uh, digital audience on this, which is very much linked to it. Um, it's, uh, this is from the um, Cheshire uh, Police and Crime Commissioner's Office, um, David McNeilidge, and it's on the Crime Prevention Agency would it not make sense to enhance the, the grip on existing community safety partnerships, matching their boundaries to police force areas and boosting their accountability to existing police governance structures like PCCs? So if we can deal with the PCC yeah. issue, please. Yes. Yeah, um, so I, I mean, on, on Megan's point, I, um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a um, I mean, I think there was, there's a correlation between the introduction of PCCs and the deterioration of neighbourhood policing, but I think the main drive behind the deterioration of neighbourhood policing was austerity. And I think that it's definitely true that, um, as Andy's report on neighbourhood policing set out, as you said, Megan, that um, these two things, localism and austerity, meant that we did have a national neighbourhood policing model um, introduced in the sort of mid-2000s, and then that kind of fractured... Um, because the national model was taken away, the thing was localised. But I think the main driver was austerity, which meant... Because um, I think if you go around and talk to most PCCs, they really, they really like to invest in neighbourhood policing, and most of them 
Um, you know, most candidates for PCCs standing in elections will always have neighbourhood policing really front and centre. So I actually think they, they would be advocates for that. And just on the point that David from uh, uh, the PCC's office in Cheshire raises, um, I think we do have a section in the report um, on the local pri crime prevention um, system because one thing I want to make really clear is we're not saying that this crime prevention agency is some kind of great big kind of octopus which is sort of with tentacles running down into the kind of, in, into kind of local decision making. It's very much focused on those areas nationally that require national strategic ownership of the prevention task, fraud, cybercrime, those kind of things. At the local level, we think that the crime prevention work should be directed by local PCCs working with, um, working with local CSPs. And we talk about a kind of redefined role for CSPs as part of that. Do you know what I, I was kind of coming on Tom's, uh, Tom Windsor's. Yeah, okay. sure. For, for first of all, Tom, thank I, I, I agree with you. It will take some political courage to see that through, and I, I'm, I'm, I very much welcome your support. Um, I'd like to set the possibly... Um, uh, absurdly ambitious uh, uh, idea in people's minds that if we got this right, if we got the learning and development right, the quality of career development right, we'd have 30,000 police officers demonstrating in favour of this step rather than against it. That's a great point. Um, gentleman here on the second row. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Ian Bretman. I'm the Chair of Trustees for the Neighbourhood Watch Network for England and Wales. Um, I'm sure my members would um, really welcome um, and be very excited about the focus in this report on um, crime prevention and neighbourhood policing. Um, it's obviously an important part of our work. And indeed, uh, our work has broadened over the past few years um, from a, a narrow focus on crime prevention advice to supporting communities become stronger, more cohesive, because we recognize that those are the factors that make a difference to a lot of the crime that, that really troubles people, um, street crime, harassment, um, antisocial behavior. And what I don't sense in the reports, and I may be judging this on an executive summary, and maybe it's got more elaboration in the main report, but uh, these, these are not factors that that are the job of the, of the police. I think the police have an in enormously critical role in supporting and facilitating them. But uh, it, I, I think it goes further than some of the statements about saying the police can't do this on their own. And I, I wonder if there is a challenge here of um, really enabling and empowering other parts of society to do this. And if it also requires a cultural change for the police to move from what is their traditional role as one of authority and one of having these unique powers into part of their work being that enabling and empowering mechanism. Thank you. Roger? I 100% agree. I mean, I, th I think that, that legitimacy, confidence in the police will come from getting that relationship that you're describing right and the fact that um, citizens take responsibility for helping uh, tackle crime and, and reducing the... the, the, the the kinds of crime you described, to me that is, uh, is absolutely sensible. And the better you get, the sooner you get the relationship right with the police. And I think the police, gen gen in, in my experience, welcome that kind of activity, but it's getting the relationship to work. Yeah, and I think um, uh, it's a good question, Ian. And I think that um, I, I always remember going to Reading in um, sort of 2005. Stan's uh, snarling because he's policed Reading for a long time. but. Um, uh, and I remember um, going to talk to local communities and police officers about co-production, um, which is you know, one of these silly technical phrases for getting the public more involved in, in, um, in prevention and, and all the things you described. And I remember uh, sitting there and, li and, and listening, and um, when I said, well, we need to get the public more involved in solving these problems, and to a man and woman, the officers there said, nope. <laughs> Don't get them involved. Um, they should, if, if there's a problem, they should phone us and we'll turn up and sort it out for them. And that was the attitude. Of course, th those were in the days where there was more money and there were you know, much better equipped neighbourhood policing teams. And there were 
were, than there are now. But there was a cultural issue there, which is still to see policing as this kind of thing that you deliver to people rather than something that you create with them. And I think, I mean, in the report we do talk about that. It's really important that, and it's really important that neighbourhood police officers are not just seeing their role as about responding and delivering stuff to people, but is about involving um, the public much more in solving these um, problems. And I see Richard from Intensive Engagement here as, as well. They do a lot of work on this. Um, and you know, that's absolutely fundamental. Robocop, I think, is the analysis of that time, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> the lady about four rows down from the back with a black scarf on. Thank you. Um, my name's Juliet Campbell. I'm a councillor in um, Lewisham, so not from the police force at all, but I do chair the Safer Communities um, Committee, which is why I'm here today. Um, thank you very much for your report. There was a gentleman down there that said everything that I was thinking in terms of the value of the report and the need for it at this time. My question focuses a little bit more on your recommendations and how far have we got in terms of those recommendations being accepted? Which are the recommendations that you think are the quick wins so we can potentially put into place early? And then I also wanted to respond to something um, that the gentleman second in said about working in collaboration with social care um, and that the police are taking on quite a lot of the role that social care system should do. Um, you know, social care is still in the thick of austerity, but I agree that collaboration is really important. And how do you think that that can happen alongside these recommendations that you made? And how do you do that partnership work with social care systems? That was a long question, but um, hopefully that And can I just a attach another question from the online who are being very prolific with their questions? This is from Ben Valentine, who is in the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner in Avon and Somerset. He says, um, have the Home Office shown any uh, agreement or any kind of uh, intention to implement these recommendations? So picking up your first point, how are they landing politically? Um, well, Juliet, thanks for the question. Thanks for coming. Um, and um, it's very important to get good relationships between councils and police officers, as you, as you know, and, and it's great that, 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 that you're, you're uh, actively contributing. Um, we, we've been in dialogue with Home Office officials as we've been writing this report uh, and they've shown a lot of interest and we've had conversations with the policing minister and with the home secretary we've also talked to the opposition front bench uh, there's a lot of interest in what we're saying so uh, we're not in a position to say these ones will definitely be accepted these ones will definitely be rejected but but there there's there's strong sense that some of these things that we talk about do need to be well, will be taken seriously, and some of them need to be acted on. It's too, it's too early to say. And th there will be a, a, a Home Office response, no doubt, and that's very important. Um, so we, we've, we've tried to build support for the proposals we've gone along. We're not in a position to commit to government or, or, or opposition uh, on this, but I think there will be serious interest in it. And, of course, all of the people in this room can influence that, because if everybody's talking about our proposals, then uh, uh, and uh, advocating them in the way to say Andy was, uh, that will that will make a big difference. So we 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 realise that the publication of the report is not the end of the story. In a way, it's the beginning of the second chapter. We'll we'll you know let's have a public debate. Let's uh, persuade people that this is the way to go. W one one thing that I um, often think about in this is a, is a mayor of New York in the early 80s called Ed Koch. He used to have a campaign speech. And then he'd finish it by saying, those are my 10 policies. If you agree with eight of them, vote for me. If you agree with all of them, see a psychiatrist. <laughs> uh, so we're not saying everybody has to do all 54. <laughs> but if, if we get the big ones done, that would be fantastic. It, com it comes back to what I was saying earlier about our aim being to create some sort of consensus. Yeah. Because in principle, yeah. this ought not to be an issue of huge dispute between political parties. Uh, so as Michael said, we've been trying to land the report with all the main political parties and see whether we can build that sort of consensus around it. And that question about politicians, by the way, was also raised by Professor Colin Rogers of the University of South Wales. And the point about co-production, if we can use that awful phrase, was also raised by Dave Valent, who is of Warwickshire Police. I'm now going to go to Helen King in the room. <coughs>
Hello, thank you. I'm Helen King. I retired as an assistant commissioner in the Met five years ago. I'm now um, unusually head of an Oxford college, but I was also a member of um, the external <coughs> advisory board. And I think the members of that, that board will, will know maybe the, the topic that I'm going to come to. Um, I think there are some fantastic recommendations here. Legitimacy is a, an issue which concerned me throughout my career. And I think there are some great proposals here, but I did worry all the way through this piece of work about were we actually getting under the skin of what drives a lack of confidence in policing in the communities that have the lowest confidence in policing. And in particular in London, that's our black communities, it's gypsy traveler Roma communities, um, and in cities across the country, there are um, probably the, some of the most vulnerable members of our populations who um, lack confidence in policing and they perhaps most need um, the support of, of the police. And I, as I say, I think there are some really good recommendations around legitimacy here. I'm really pleased that we're calling for uh, legislative change to allow positive action in the, uh, positive discrimination in, in recruiting um, as per the Northern Ireland model. But I don't think that we're getting anywhere near addressing the history and the narratives amongst um, some of those communities that I've just mentioned. And I fear that if we do turn around the direction of travel um, about confidence in policing for the rest of the population, those communities will fall even further behind. Um, I do recognize this, this report tried to cover uh, a lot at a very high level um, and maybe didn't have the capacity to get specifically uh, to those issues. But I, I guess my question is, who, when, and how is that going to be tackled? And I, I think even looking around this, this room, um, we can see that we, we, at some level, we're not close enough to understanding those communities and how we can positively address the, the legacy of the, the history that those communities still carry very strongly. Thanks, Helen. Rick. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, what the point you make about history is, is really important. And one of the things that we do um, I'm not saying that everything in our... I mean, one of the key things we say in the report is that we need a, a national plan to improve legitimacy and confidence, particularly um, among black people in, in, in the police. And, um, and one of the sort of principles that we do argue for in that section of the report is that too often people have approached the question of public confidence and police legitimacy through this issue of um, procedural justice, you know, that it's all, all just about... Um, you know, if, if the police just are trained well enough in, in one to one encounters to be procedurally fair, then automatically that will lead to a, an improvement in police legitimacy. And what we say in the report is actually that, you know, that the evidence doesn't sustain that. Procedural justice is a necessary thing. It's absolutely necessary that the police treat people fairly. But if you're, uh, you know, if you've been stopped and searched, 10 times in the last week, um, you know, even if all of those stops and searches were procedurally fair, which they probably weren't, um, uh, you know, there would still be a problem because you're being, you feel you're being disproportionately policed compared to other people. Um, and, uh, and also you're coming into that with a whole long history of experience. Um, so it's not just about improving the, um, the, one, you know, the one-off encounters, it's about addressing the long history of um, of, of police um, race relations in this country and that requires something much more than just you know more procedural justice training so we do say that in the report and I think the plan that we argue for has to encompass that it's a kind of long-term thing about building confidence in those communities and uh, you know I, I don't think we've got all of the answers in this report to that but I think we do need a plan in place to to try to achieve it just add that I think it, need, it requires active engagement with those communities going to them rather than waiting for the for, 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 for you know wait, waiting for, for them to adjust to, to what is being recommended and I, I mean, in the, I, I've as you know worked a lot in education and in every time I've seen people address these deep equity issues in education it's because they've actively gone out and engaged with the communities themselves um, so if you talk about the Bangladeshi community in Tower Hamlets, uh, I've, I've visited the East London Mosque three times in the last uh, five years, and to, to hear how that community has, re -enga has engaged with the education system and the relationship between the two, I think with these police... 
to really engage with the community, actively go and seek out these debates to build the legitimacy. Thanks. I've got Lord Herbert at the back, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, I'd just like to echo, uh, Nick Herbert, Chair of the College of Policing, uh, I'm sorry. I'd just like to echo um, Andy Marsh's comments in uh, really welcoming uh, this report. And, and thank you very much indeed, Rick and Michael, for your uh, presentations. Um, for the breadth of its ambition, w while it's grounded in a kind of realism, because I think if you'd gone down a sort of cul-de-sac of saying uh, that uh, it's only about resources or uh, we should abolish the 43-4 structure or whatever, it, it may have been unimplementable unimpl by, by, by any government or it realistically. And so I, I think it strikes the, the right balance between being ambitious and especially in the areas that the college also wishes to be ambitious as reflected in our fundamental review through uh, leadership development, uh, uh, professional development, which I increasingly think are sort of completely key to all of the other problems. Uh, in the way that Michael, I think, described. The question I wanted to ask is, um, having had the experience last year of reporting uh, on a, uh, in, in a similar uh, way uh, for the Commission for Smart Government, which looked at uh, how Whitehall should be uh, reformed, and coming up with a, a series of, of radical but doable uh, proposals, I think the challenge we found was getting, uh, getting those uh, proposals implemented, particularly with the kind of bandwidth that government appears to have uh, at the moment, and sustaining the work of the commission and the recommendations uh, beyond the publication of the final report to ensure that things actually did happen. And that does go to the question of the appetite in the police service, and Andy hinted at this, for the changes, particularly around the areas of enhancing leadership and professional development. How big is that appetite? Will this really happen? And what can you do as the review to make sure that your proposals are put into practice? Thanks, Nick. And can I just add a question from our audience, which is along similar lines, but it's from uh, a sergeant uh, in Sussex Police, uh, Rasheen Vafe. I hope I've got your name right, Rasheen. How do those of us with many years of service ahead of us get invested in these recommendations and influence the change needed while still in the lower ranks of policing? So that's about how do you mobilise uh, the service in b behind the report? Um, really good questions from uh, um, uh, Nick and, um, uh, and, the, and the online contributor as well. I think, um, well, one thing we're going to try and do is make sure that um, we, you know, this is a central mission for the Police Foundation. Uh, you know, our agenda for the next few years is going to be try to galvanise support for the recommendations that we've set out and um, we have raised some resources which will um, uh, help us to do that because we don't see the publication of the report as being the end of the story. As Michael said, it has to be the start of a, the next kind of chapter um, and we'll be going out, we're doing a, a road show, we're going out to local forces uh, around the country to talk about our recommendations, get feedback from practitioners um, understand, um, you know, learn from them, get their responses to what we're uh, suggesting. Uh, and I think that's the way of sort of pivoting into the, into the, the second question, which was about, um, you know, how do we, people who have got a lot of service ahead of them in policing and how do they, um, uh, how do they contribute? Well, we, we will be reaching out to people. We do have, a, as I say, a roadshow planned. We are going to be um, putting on events um, and so on. So we're going to be trying to do a lot of activity um, to try to keep the conversation going and, uh, and to keep talking to government, who we do have, you know, we are going to keep talking to government about these recommendations, talking to all of the different institutions, many of whom are represented here, who support some of these recommendations and just um, seeing what we can do to, to build on them uh, and, and take them further. So that's, that's our ambition at least. Yeah, and get, starting with Nick, Nick's uh, very, very, very helpful comments, and, and uh, we've, we, uh, thank you for the uh, the, the comments you made, we try to be both ambitious and realistic in, in the way we've set this out. So it is doable, um, but it does, need, it does need enthusiasm within the police service. It doesn't need unanimous, it doesn't need consensus at the beginning that, that Bill is right, we're, we're talking about, yeah, but, but it needs enough enthusiasm to get started on this. And I think some, some people within the police service can get on and, uh, and start doing some of the things that we're uh, talking about while we wait and see what the government is 
doing, as I've said, we've had very good dialogue with the Home Office, in, in, including with the ministers there, uh, and I'm hopeful that some of the, some of the recommendations will be um, strongly adopted. But there's, a, there's, a, there is, there's an issue about bandwidth, as you mentioned, for, for government. And the, the example I like from history on that is in 1940, in, um, you know, when, the, when the Blitz was just starting and the, 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 the Battle of Britain was just over, there was a, a, a permanent secretary in the Department for Education, then called the Board of Education, who he was, he was evacuating children across the country. That, that was the main task of the, uh, of the Board of Education. And he, he got six officials, senior officials, together and said, look, we can manage this without you. I've booked you a hotel in Bournemouth. I want you to spend the next three months there to design the education system for after the war. That's before the Soviet Union is in the war, before the uh, United States is in the war, and when Britain might conceivably have lost. So w with these things, and that's why we want this strategic capacity in the Home Office, w whatever the bandwidth and the pressures on government, and they're huge at the moment, you do need to be able to get a dedicated focus on what's the future of policing going to look like and how do we get there and what are the steps on the road. So I hope that the, the Home Office will take our report and look at the recommendation we're making and really think, well, what do we want to unfold here, regardless of all the pressures on us right at the moment? I think it's really important. And on mobilising the, the service, the online question, I think there's lots of uh, enthusiasts among young, young police officers uh, newly coming in saying we want a better future for us, we want a better career progression, that would be good. And finding advocates within <coughs> police forces who are going to adopt some of these things early and get on with it, I think there's a real opportunity. Thanks, Michael. Fiona. Uh, sorry, over there. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Fiona Hamilton from The Times. I just had a couple of questions about the issues of ethics and misconduct. I was looking at Recommendation 16 about police misconduct hearings. I wondered if you would elaborate on what your concern is there, and specifically, are you concerned that there are officers who should have been dismissed from forces who are still in the police service? And then secondly, you talk about the issue of corrosive, nothing being more corrosive than public, uh, in public trust. The last year and the series of misogyny and racism scandals that we've seen, can you elaborate a bit on exactly how corrosive you think that's been for the service and also the issue of policing by consent? Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Um, really good questions. I mean, the, the recommendation we make around misconduct hearings is um, motivated, which is that the government should review um, who chairs the misconduct hearings, because the concern that we heard, particularly from chief constables, was that they don't feel that they have enough uh, control over the misconduct process. In other words, that they're... Um, uh, probably for you know, decent reasons, it was recommended that the, the, the hearings be chaired by uh, a lay person. Um, but um, uh, the, we don't have hard evidence on this, but, the, but all of the views that we're getting in the system, um, quite clearly that people feel that um, these independent chairs are actually essentially, I mean, essentially softer uh, on people than, than, than senior police officers would be. And so we think if you've got a system where um, you, you know, you've got, you've got people being found um, guilty of misconduct, but then um, the proper sanctions aren't being made. It appears that that um, is happening more with, um, with these independent chairs. So we think the government should review it um, and look at the evidence base and decide whether we should go back to a system where those hearings are chaired by uh, a senior police officer rather than an independent chair. So that's the, that's the rationale for doing that, to, ma to make sure that, um, uh, you know, I find it bizarre that um, you know chief, chief officers, if you like, hold the the risk around um, their you know if there are people in their police force who are committing misconduct, but seem to have very little control over what to do about the people who are found guilty of misconduct. I think you know in my organisation, if I was told um, you know you found someone guilty of misconduct, but I couldn't myself do anything about it, um, that's a problem. And I have some sympathy with the Commissioner of the Met in that respect, you know, because it's, it's you know, th there's, there are limits under the current system uh, in terms of what you can do um, th through the misconduct rule. So we, we argue for that to be reviewed. Um, and I think it has been very corrosive, is the answer to that. I think, the, you know, what we've heard, I mean, you, you know, um, I felt physically sick. Um, I can't be the only person in this room who felt physically sick reading what was said by police officers at Charing Cross Police Station. It's absolutely appalling reading things that I've never heard anyone say those sort of things in my life. And to hear them from police officers, I, I think, was really quite um, appalling. And so I think um, it is very corrosive. And that's why it's obviously we have to wait to see the, the current inquiries that are, 
that are being undertaken. But uh, that's why we argue for this 10-year plan to address, um, um, to improve public confidence and legitimacy and dealing with all of the issues around racism and, and misogyny are absolutely core to that. And if you look at the, the new mission statement for policing that we wrote down in the report, we, we argue for going further in that um, uh, and, making, and making sure that policing is anti-racist, not just that it treats people fairly, but it is that policing should be anti-racist, anti-misogyny, um, uh, which is a more proactive um, attitude towards um, tackling, uh, tackling those things. So, um, so yeah, I think it is very corrosive and I think it needs, um, it needs real grip and it needs a real action plan to, 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 um, to tackle the problem. No, you know, we don't, you know, if someone wants to say to me, how common is this? Very hard to say, isn't it? It's very hard to quantify this and you can talk to people and they say, well, I, you know, I think it's, it, it, it's quite common. Other people say that it isn't, but it's quite clear the things that have been coming out it's a lot more common than we would all want, um, and, uh, and it therefore needs to be um, a major priority. Michael, do you want to add something? I, I totally agree with everything Rick said. I won't repeat it, but I think it's absolutely right. And, and it relates to the five-year um, license practice that obviously needs to be thought about in the same context. Okay, I'm going to take two together now because I've got loads of people. Name. I've got the chap who's next to Martin Hugh with the glasses. Uh, sorry, see in row three along here, yeah, you, um, and then the gentleman, and if you could pass the mic to the gentleman who is sitting, I think, on the row behind you. Yeah. Good. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rudy Hôpital from the French Embassy Police Attaché, thank you. Rick, I'll take the opportunity to thank the Police Foundation and Rick for inviting international colleagues in such ambitious an arena, indeed. Uh, policing in the UK is looked at around the world, uh, and Britain is global, and in a, in a more global word, so my question would be about uh, international informed policing and maybe it resonates with you, your international communities and legitimacy in the country, but also um, international connectivity and relates to crime because uh, I reckon that uh, in your, your organization that you suggest you report policing into its local capacity, you know, ironically, an organization that sounds uh, very familiar to a French with a central, a big central um, brain and a, 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 a strong regional uh, quadre and after a, a local delivery. But uh, uh, although you put policing in that local arena uh, and agenda, uh, even in, in uh, this arena, fraud, uh, financial crime, even rape, there is an international footprint and respond to international assistance and being informed in, t in terms of international uh, connect connections is it sounds f for me very important so yeah. i i want i wanted to know why it was mentioned into your systemic cap capabilities in policing if you can uh, explain about that a little bit more let, let me just say a couple of oh, lines no, no, can oh, i take sorry, the sorry, behind sorry, you because yes, i'm going to take yes, them in twos yes, otherwise yeah, you might yeah, please do yeah we might run out of time. Yeah, we will. Thank you. <laughs> Bob Harris, a management consultant working many years in police. Um, the question of resources, mention of austerity and so on, has been uh, raised a few times this morning. Um, it, it seems to me that the next couple of decades, we aren't going to have additional resources spent on the public sector. We all know the pressures in many other sectors. Um, another strategic change seems to me happening across a lot of public services is the expectation that people, the community, are going to do more things themselves in health, in education, uh, and so on. Um, so if the panel agrees with that, to what extent do they think the public can do more themselves? Clearly there are opportunities in, in the prevention space. Um, we have technologies to help people be a bit safer, alarms, communications to find missing people, um, the things you can do to prevent fraud and so on. Uh, but it, it seems to me we've shifted towards more of a dependence on a public service, the, the police, and there's an opportunity and perhaps a strategic need to see what the community needs to do themselves. Thank you. 
Two very different questions there, Rick. <laughs> yeah, sure, okay, I'll, I'll start um, with Rudy's question on international uh, cooperation. And um, I, I think um, it, it's absolutely essential, you know, and, and um, one of the key things we argue for in the report is strengthening the National Crime Agency, because which, which kind of in many ways um, is at the centre of some of the, the international work which is being done, particularly around serious and organised crime, of course. Um, and um, it's absolutely, cr but it is absolutely critical. And you know, in, in many ways, I'd like to do a review of international cooperation <laughs> in, in law enforcement because actually, if you look at why um, you know the FBI was created in America after the railway was created, and all of a sudden you have this thing, crimes crossing state lines. And what we've seen with the internet is this enormous explosion of crimes crossing almost any jurisdictional lines that exist. And I think that is ripe for. Uh, a review in and of itself, you know, the, do we, how can we strengthen international cooperation, um, do we need um, more, much more kind of joint capability uh, between countries to investigate crimes and so on, and uh, obviously we have um, Europol, well we're sadly no longer a member of Europol, but we, uh, we have, uh, there is Europol which has been strengthened considerably in recent years, and Interpol as well, but I think, um, I think there's, it's really important to strengthen international policing cooperation. Um, and can the public do more themselves? Um, I think um, yes, and I think the, the prevention uh, sort of section that we talk about, that is all about mobilising the rest of society because it's, it's basically our analysis that the police can't just deal with all of this stuff, that actually we need to mobilise the rest of society and that means businesses, it also means members of the public. Um, and, um, and of course, you know, the Crime Prevention Agency, for example, can provide consistent advice about what you should do to protect yourself against fraud and, and cybercrime and so on. But, you know, but the public then also need to, um, to take this into their own hands and, and act upon that advice. So, yeah, I think um, the public role is absolutely uh, critical in that. Just commenting on both questions, on, on, the, on the French colleague, the, the, I, I, everything Nick said about the National Cri uh, Crime Agency is fundamental here, and the, the sharing of intelligence is crucial to this in these big uh, international crime scenarios like, like uh, fraud, for example, where the sharing of intelligence between countries is going to be quite critical to, to, to solving some of those problems. Um, on, the, on the second point, um, the, the, there is, and it's general, I think it was implied in what you said, it's not just about the police, but that there has been a bit of a tendency over the last 30 or 40 years to for, for the public to assume that once it's a public service, it's the job of the public service to solve all the problems and just to wait for that to be done. Keith Joseph said sometime in the early 1980s, the first words a baby learns in this country, what's the government going to do about it? Uh, and there's a bit of that attitude around. Uh, and so, so you do want people taking more responsibility in, in the way that uh, uh, our colleague from uh, f was saying earlier uh, on, on Neighbourhood Watch and so on. There was, a, there was a slight risk in what you said that if, if, if you say to the public, you need to take more responsibility because we're going to spend less or because we've got less money, then actually that breeds cynicism. So you've got, to, you've got to, in order to get the, the collaboration that you're talking about, you do actually have to keep investing in the police service. Okay, thanks, Matt. Is, is that Leroy in the back corner there? Mine. I th I th Pardon? It is, yeah, yeah, I thought it, it was. Well, you might, might be. You've grown a beard since I last saw you. So <laughs> I got Leroy, and then I got the gentleman who's next to Fiona as well. Um, and while actually, before you do that, can I? There's a question here from Simon Down from the West Midlands OPCC, uh, and I'm actually going to, to take the uh, uh, question myself because he says we're increasingly taking a public health approach to preventing harmful behaviours within our community. Does this report add weight to the arguments for taking a public health approach to crime prevention? Yes, it does. If you read it. Primary, secondary, tertiary, absolutely nails the issue, I think. So while I've done that little advert for a public health approach, I'm going to go to Leroy at the back. Yeah, uh, no, I always had a beard. It's just grey now. <laughs> that, that's the big difference. Um, I, um, I've actually welcomed uh, this report. I had a chance to have an input in one of the early meetings last year. And um, again, it, it was around cultural shift um, now, you've highlighted Operation Hutton and the, the Charing Cross issue. Um, having served at Charing Cross, uh, it's, I'm not saying it's perfect, but if you read that report, it's not about the general response teams. It's actually a 
a squad that was housed within the station. And uh, I think there needs to be uh, an, an understanding around the subcultures that seem to be more hardened in units that are separated from general policing because the internal checks and balances, especially around leadership, in particular supervisors, is an issue not only around holding officers to account but being um, complicit by their silence because it's m much closer, the proximity. And, uh, and of course that also has an impact on learning and the boundaries that are set. So I wanted to know if this report really has gone into the nuances of those subcultures. I mean, cousins uh, in the parliamentary and diplomatic unit, again, seem to yes, show yeah. that hardened view in a squad unit specialist um, environment. And I just wanted to know if we're looking at that closely. If we take the gentleman just next to Fiona, and we'll take both questions together. <coughs> uh, Azan Zaki, human rights activist. Um, I'd like to take issue with the one of your conclusions in the report, much as I re welcome the rest of the report. Uh, you talk about hate crimes having increased by 194%. There's not a shred of evidence to support this on the basis of any verifiable independent evidence. Hate crime is not a crime. There's no, sub there's no objective definition of hate crime except for two small pieces of legislation. Hate crime is a concept which is based on policy capture by vocal lobby groups who are claiming that hate crime has increased on this or that basis. Hate crime is actually uh, something which is being invented to a certain extent by the College of Policing with its practice manual on so-called non-crime hate incidents, which are not crimes, but which are recorded as, as, as crimes on, on, uh, on the PNC and so on. Now, you know, I do think that this needs to be, to be addressed because it's part of a continual blurring of criminal and civil as with ASBOs, which are also uh, a blurring of civil and criminal. So what is actually happening when, when crime is increasing in certain respects, like fraud, cybercrime and so on, uh, too much attention is being given to, to incidents which do not meet the objective cr criteria of criminal justice. Uh, do you think this is actually a, s a sensible uh, 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 road to go down, or is this something which should actually uh, be, be reviewed. The Law Commission has recently uh, issued a, 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 a very long report, which hardly anybody has read, which is very ambiguous in its conclusions. Some things are hate crimes, some things are not hate crimes. There's no objective basis for this. So uh, uh, increasingly, the idea of hate crimes will be contested. And in fact, it is being contested uh, with cases against the college policing, which will uh, possibly lead to uh, financial liabilities uh, 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 from f for the college, which will eventually come out of police budgets. Thank you. Two very different questions. Yeah. Um, so uh, just starting with Leroy's question first, I think um, the yeah, absolutely. This issue of uh, I completely agree with what you say, Leroy, about um, specialist units um, perhaps removed from uh, frontline policing and the dangers of kind of um, sub problematic subcultures developing in those. And I think it's just really important to say there isn't this one thing called police culture. There are subcultures uh, in any um, organisation. And, and of course, those things need to be the kind of uh, the focus of efforts to, uh, to deal with this problem. So we do absolutely recognise that. And we also uh, put a lot of emphasis in the report on frontline supervision and the support that's provided for frontline supervisors. Um, uh, you know, there was a, um, I think it was in the College of Policing 2015 leadership review concluded that the sergeant rank was a development free zone uh, in terms of support for training and development. And I don't think very much has changed since 2015, you know, and I, and I think there's a tackling a lot of these issues, strengthening that frontline supervision is absolutely critical. So I completely agree with, um, with the point that, that, that you made. Um, and on the, um, uh, nice to see you again, and, and at the, um, the, 
uh, the point on the, what we, the 90, 193% is hate crime incidents reported to the police. So that is not, um, unless one of my team can clarify, it is, it is hate crime incidents reported to the police. So it's not um, non-crime incidents. It's, it's not just sort of, um, uh, you know, non-crime hate incidents are not included in that figure. But that's, um, that, that's the data that we've, uh, that we've got in the report. So, um, uh, and, you know, to be honest, we don't go into... Um, the whole question of hate crime in a great deal of detail in this other than to make the point that it's a, a rising a growing source of police demand which needs um that needs a response to it i just want to comment one on uh, going back to leroy's point that the the example you gave of how lots of officers who work from charing cross will have been quite a f uh, disturbed by the reporting of that and by the, the, the incidents because they're good professional officers doing a good job. And that, that's, that's the issue all the way with confidence in the police. And that's why we're recommending stronger processes, including the five-year renewal of licence, to make sure you can tackle the, the handfuls that tarnish the entire police force and also enhance learning. So I, I, think, I think we're on to the issue that you raised. Uh, but um, as Rick said, there's, there's obviously more we can do on the, the nuances of, of different uh, units within the police. But it's a very, very good point. It's not a problem that's unique to the police. I mean, I no. think there's lots of examples. And I've got some experience of the defence world. And, and in the military, small specialist units develop cultures of their own, which are very hard to crack sometimes. We used to talk about that a lot. Do you remember all the issues about rig approach years ago in the Met and corruption in those small specialist units? And it's maybe something we haven't done as much work on in recent years. And it's time, a very timely reminder to think about those sorts of cultures and the way they develop. Now, I'm going to do three people um, because I'm looking at the clock. I've got Ian Loder, I've got the lady in the black cardigan next to him, and I've got the gentleman there about five rows back. And he'll grab the mic when you go up there. Ian. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Ian Loder from the Centre for Criminology at Oxford and also a member of the advisory board. Um, I, I, I've been reflecting on two of the, two of the challenges that you, you set out at the beginning, Rick, and, and the relationship between that and the, the, the kind of balance of the report. What, what, one is the, just the sheer amount of crime that people experience this day, the, now, which is basically online or is fraud. <laughs> and I think it, we have to probably register the, the, the import of that. And the other is the, 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 the graph you put up about detection rates, which in a sense is a, is a, is a subspecies of a wider problem of attrition in, in kind of criminal justice. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a strong temptation, <laughs> partly because of the kind of institutional, as it were, presence of the police, and because of the strong cultural association we make between crime and policing, of thinking that we can respond to both those things by fixing the police as an organisation. <laughs> and and I, my sense is that's the wrong way to go. <laughs> Um, and the most radical and innovative thing about the report is, is the, the attention you draw to a kind of public safety ecosystem and the kind of role of the Crime Prevention Agency and the duty, in that, in, uh, uh, the duty of, on businesses to, um, to, to, to think about the, the crime, the criminogenic aspects of their everyday activities. Um, and in that context, here, here's, the, here's the kind of worry, and in the, the, the sense of worry has been reflected by the conversation in this room. The, the, we, the, all of its, a lot of the conversation, not all of it by any means, has gravitated back to the police. So the, so the worry is, and I suppose the, the question that flows from that is, how, how do you ensure that the kind of public safety crime prevention aspects of what the Commission has recommended don't get lost because they don't resonate culturally with how we think about crime? <laughs> And because they don't have a kind of institutional player <laughs> who's invested in invested in creating something that doesn't currently exist, rather than reforming something in which they work and they care about and want to make better. Penelope Gibbs from Transform Justice, and in fact, my question is related to that because it's about how can the police be seen to be legitimate and effective if our criminal justice system as a whole is not effective. So I want to use the example of criminal sanctions. There is very little evidence that criminal sanctions reduce offending. And for instance, domestic abuse, the College of Policing meta-analysis of international research says that criminal sanctions do not reduce domestic abuse. 
So in the context of that, how can the police themselves be seen to be effective by the public? Thank you, Penelope. And last in the room, and, and I will, while that microphone's moving back, saying there are lots of people who I know who sent in really good questions, although I hate me for not asking their questions, but I've just been inundated in such fantastic uh, questions. But, so thank you, everybody. Maybe the foundation, I don't know, will do something with some of these questions. Sorry to give you a job. I just wanted to pick up on uh, what you were talking about earlier and what some of the other um, audience members have talked about, trust and confidence. Sometimes that can be a bit of an abstract where you try and drill below it. If I think of trust and confidence from women and ethnic and minority communities, particularly for ethnic and black communities, it's 20% lower than the national average. Is putting frontline officers or investing in frontline officers, putting them in neighbourhoods, going to strengthen that trust? Because this goes back decades. It's, it's, you talked about this crisis in um, policing. It, it goes back decades. Is it, is it as easy as just putting more officers on the road and then just expecting them to gel with communities? We know that you know, more women are saying now they don't feel safe walking alone at night. And then we have, um, for example, the Metropolitan Police will say, well, we're going to put some female officers out so you can go and talk to them and you can walk with them. Is that enough to kind of really re to kind of embed in some of these issues? Because a lot of it comes back down to how officers and how um, how police officers, you know, communicate with other communities. And you can't say that you're who's strip searching young black boys and expecting them to be empowered the next. So I just wanted to kind of find out if you had spoken to any of these community groups and what work had gone on to kind of establish some of those ideas that you've set out in your report. Thanks. Thank you. Um, three great questions and, and not much time, but um, on, on the, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go in reverse order. On, on the th th this question, um, just putting more police officers out there isn't going to change things for the reasons implied in what you say, but the, if you get police officers with the right attitude, with the right training, with the right development, with the right relationship to the community and changing the communities in the way they relate to the police, this can be turned around over time and this can be changed. And it is really important. Um, and the, all the questions earlier about engagement between communities and police at specific level, not, not just the whole of the national community, but in particular communities, I do think needs to be addressed. And it isn't just about having more people out there uh, it's about the relationship between them. It's about the skills the police have. It's about the way that relationship works. On Penelope's question, um, we we haven't gone in. In the, we, we're focused on the police in this, and there is a whole set of issues about the criminal justice system that you raise, um, and the relationship between police and the CPS, which uh, is not nearly as good as it should be. And then further down through into the criminal justice system, there's a whole set of issues there, but. We're not saying, um, I don't think you're arguing we are, but just to reinforce, we're not saying that um, more sentencing or whatever is going to solve crime. On the contrary, we're saying you have to change things upstream, start with preventing crime and then solve more crimes. And then when you do have people who are, are charged, make sure that goes through smoothly through the criminal justice system. But we're not talking about the reform of the criminal justice system. There was talk um, in government of a, of a Royal Commission on the criminal justice system. Uh, that hasn't uh, that hasn't happened yet, but that that may be where some of the issues you're raising will be addressed. And then on Ian's question, first of all, Ian, it allows me the opportunity to thank you very much for your outstanding contribution throughout our advisory groups. I've learnt such a lot from from all of that. Um, but you you're um, you're completely you're completely right that we that there's a risk that the debate defaults to a debate among people who, who think and write about the police and that we don't involve the people beyond that that are absolutely essential if we're going to get into the, the, the public safety system we talk about. And that will be an issue. Uh, I, I, Rick and I will talk, uh, and Bill, about, about how the police foundation can build those relationships, how people like you can help us. Uh, but we do need to take it well beyond the home office, well beyond the police forces. Uh, and I think we'll get quite a reaction uh, to some of the quiet crime prevention proposals from business and so on. And we need people who can engage in that debate and see that it's good for business as well as good for the country. But, but it's, it's a really important potential challenge for us to deal with in taking this forward. Yeah, and I, well, I, I, and I, I agree with what you said, Ian. And I think that um, 
in terms of how we win support for it, because there aren't the institutional stakeholders, I think the way to do that is to look at you know, the single biggest crime affecting people in the country, fraud. Um, and we don't really have an answer to it as a society as yet. And, and our, our um, claim in this report is that the Crime Prevention Agency is, um, is part of that answer, you know, that, we're, that, that there's currently too little strategic ownership at a national level for trying to prevent fraud uh, and cybercrime. And, and increasingly, that's stuff that the public does care about. You know, I think the public are increasingly concerned about it. Um, you know, I, I, I've been talking to um, uh, groups of people who've been victims of investment fraud and have lost all their life savings, you know, and are looking at being sort of penniless in, in their old age because they've, and, and people just sort of think, oh, fraud, you know, you get your money back and it's fine. Well, that's not um, often the case. And um, uh, so the, the biggest single crime type in the country, and we don't have a strategic answer to it, as I can see at the moment, and that's where I think the Crime Prevention Agency comes in. So I think in terms of winning the argument is to sort of say, what are we doing about this vast amount of crime <laughs> at the moment that we know we can't arrest our way out of, we know we're not going to get many of these people in front of courts, so we have to do something differently. So that's one of the ways, I think, to mobilise support for taking a different approach to crime, not just on that, but more generally as well. I've, I've begun engaging, but it's a, dro a drop in the ocean compared to what is needed with people in the city, with the, um, the CBI and so on. So we've begun that conversation, but it's only just the beginning. What Ian's question highlights is the importance of what we've begun to talk about as phase two of this, because if I may say so, I think this event has helped us think about phase two, because uh, getting this to land is still a big challenge, of course it is. And on that note, Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you for the report and uh, lots of work to do, but can we thank people in the usual way? Thank you. Thank you.